Hello, world. My name is Dr. Cody Peterson. Thank you for tuning in to uh, the next installment of uh, the Kenigma's Advisor Elevation. I want to give a big welcome to our, our guest, our uh, expert cultivation uh, advisor, uh, Stephen Philpott Jr. What's up, dude? Hey, hey, how you doing, Cody? Good to be out and finally have this conversation. I know it's been uh, long awaited. Yeah, we've been we've been Look, Steve and I talk a lot, uh, but but this one in particular is like, yo, dude, you want to go live? You want to talk to the strangers on the internet? Maybe about yourself a little bit, maybe about your favorite plant. And I clearly he said yes, y'all. And I'm here now. Cody got me. <laughs> I'm a secret uh, squirrel, but now everything's out. Right, right. So you're actually coming to us from Chicago, correct? Correct. I am in um, the Bronzeville neighborhood of Chicago. Bronzeville neighborhood. Okay. It is no longer cannabis cultivation season in Chicago. I mean, all cannabis in the state of Illinois is grown indoors. So all cannabis, even for patients who have home grow uh, options, they must grow it inside. Can't be visible. Uh, okay. Has to be indoors if you're a medical patient and all the big companies, they're all indoors. We have no outdoor flower here. Let's just yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, because I'm coming from California, you know, sun grown is sort of this, uh, it's almost a you become a marketing term. Well, not almost it, it is. And it's interesting, because it's not maybe just a marketing term, right? And so maybe we'll we'll dabble into some differences in, in uh, sun grown versus indoor. Uh, but yeah, so Steven's coming to us from Chicago. This is where he, he's currently living. But Steve, can you tell us a little bit about sort of your background and how you came to be such a such a cultivation uh guru that that we found you on linkedin and i said i gotta i gotta work with this guy brought him in and now steven's even working with us on our cultivation guide so kenig was really really excited that we're putting together uh an entry-level cultivation guide and steven's gonna help us here introduce sort of the general science of, of cultivating plants. So super excited to see what you what you put together for us, Stephen. Yeah, no, um, super excited about the guide coming out. Um, I think sometimes experience is the best experience, whether it's good or bad experience. And um, I think that's something that everybody's kind of learned on their path into cannabis, regardless of where they came from. I don't even think we trust people in cannabis who haven't been through a little bit of like rough areas. So um, it's definitely that. Yeah, so I guess uh, you asked about what you, you asked about kind of how I got. Well, into I mean, I guess yeah, I mean, I guess so. Yeah, we, we're getting there. That's how we're working together. You're one of our our expert uh, guides and trying to help us work through these articles that that aren't sort of um, in my necessary wheelhouse, which is pharmacology. You're on the cultivation side, but how does one go from uh, city boy in in Chicago to, to cultivation expert? I know you had a little military service in there that I thought you could share with the with the viewers. Yeah, so um, I guess I'll kind of pick up from that military experience. So I grew up in a family that was like not for cannabis, except my grandfather. He definitely used cannabis. Um, he was even arrested while he was using cannabis, while he had he was undergoing uh, chemotherapy. So outside of him secretly using cannabis, my family was like definitely against it. Um, but one of my closest friends and now my business partner for my consulting company, Anzisha Consulting, he had cancer when he was younger, and I knew. He was smoking like we all just kind of knew everybody our age kind of knew he smoked. And, you know, honestly, nobody really questioned him. It was like, hey, have you had cancer? No. All right. Well, don't mess <laughs> don't with pass judgment. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Once you have a friend who's a kid who fights cancer, it's just like, yo, he's he's you know, he's kind of hardened. He's a little more like he, he kind of thinks like the adults do. So, um, you know, he was ridiculed when we were younger, but he used to always tell all of us one day this is going to be legal. And I'm like, Ew. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't know. A lot of people in jail for that herb right there. <laughs> yeah, we're in Chicago, so people don't understand when they see like Chicago's the most violent city, blah, blah, blah. Chicago was the blueprint for the war on drugs. If you want to see what a successful war on drug looked like, Chicago was the blueprint. They went in, tore down businesses, tore down communities, and like they still haven't recovered. So that's what I'm living in. And one of my closest friends is telling me, yeah, man, this is going to be legal. It's going to change the world. And I'm like, I'm not saying you're crazy. I'm just saying <laughs> I don't yet see it. You don't see it. Exactly. Yeah. So this is like high school, man. And, you know, like it's becoming more common. And I'm like, all right, 
he's right. More people are consuming, but it's still a very stigmatized. Like my high school was the first high school in the state of Illinois to drug test athletes in high school. So if you were an athlete every morning over the intercom, you would hear random athletic drug testing, random athletic drug testing. And they would name, you know, mostly football players and basketball players. Cause that's what is. Wow. Yeah. Talk about, you know, like the the war on drugs gone, uh, you know, like uh, what's the word I want to say? Uh, it's a different universe. Like we would never thought over the loudspeaker, high school athletes, the stakes are exorbitantly low. Like yep. I, this is just so strange. Not to mention the idea of drug testing athletes, even even today, is based on performance. And in this case, if you're looking for weed, it's not really what we're screening for. People aren't misusing cannabis for their athletics. They're they're probably and, just and they cannabis. made it. They made it very clear to us as thirteen and fourteen year old kids, like, hey. We're going to call your name. If you leave, and they made sure they did it in second period. So first period, attendance is taken. Second period, they already know that you're in school, and then they call your name. They would tell you, like, yo, if you leave school, that's as good as you uh, testing positive for a test. And we were like, that's too much weight for a 13-year-old, 14-year-old. Even an 18-year-old, that's a lot of weight. You know, even putting that on professional athletes is, is a pretty heavy burden, albeit. So One that's in for that for reason, I was not smoking in high school. I had friends who smoked, but I was just like, all it takes is one day for our name to get called over the intercom and boom, like it was. And then we started seeing some people getting tested regularly. And we we're like, I thought this was random. Like I'm taking probability, you know, and statistics. And they're telling me, <laughs> <laughs> this <laughs> isn't normal. <laughs> this is a statistically significant bias towards picking, deviations. <laughs> yeah. Why are you picking our quarterback every other week? Right. So um, for that reason, again, I'm seeing all these different things. War on drugs tore down Chicago. Closest friend is using. And my high school, they're telling you, like, if you use this, we will ruin your high school mm-hmm. athletic career. Um after high so school, not friendly for weed. In high school, you never tried cannabis. Oh, I tried it once and was paranoid. Paranoid. <laughs> not because of the plant. I actually enjoyed the relaxation, but I was just like, how long does this stay in your system? The person who I actually tried it with was the person who they were testing like every other week. So I'm like, oh, man, wow. I know that there's athletes in our school of all nationalities, all races, all orientations, everybody's using cannabis. And I'm like, man, I don't know. I'm just not trying to get caught. My mom will kick me out the house. So secret, I had a 1.8 GPA in high school. Um, I grew up in an abusive household and I wasn't really focused on school and class. Like to me, it was like, what do you need to graduate? They told me a 1.8. I got exactly a 1.8. I did just enough to like stay in school. So I never wanted to do something. You weren't always a nerd. No, to me, school was where your pa- to, to me school was where your parents sent you when they went to go make money. Just being honest, like as a kid Baby growing sitter. up in the city, yeah, that's how a lot of teachers they tell you they're like, yo, I'm you know I, I hate babysitting kids. So to me, academia was a terrible place. The teachers were on strike. You knew they didn't want like when you see teachers striking now. There's kids that are in class like my teachers do not want to be here, and neither do I. So when you grow up like that, you're just like academia what i'm trying you said when i'm 17 i can leave cool i'm gonna do whatever i need to do so that was my experience with academia so i had to join the military after high school and i was fortunate that i grew up in a military family men in my family have served in every war since world war ii so it wasn't like ah it was just like oh this must be like destiny or something because clearly i'm not going to college to play sports with a 1.8 gpa um and in the military guess what you're not doing consuming cannabis oh or, or smoking weed, smoking weed. <laughs> but what's funny was the same childhood friend that i grew up with in chicago from church he ended up in school in north carolina where i got stationed so oh, now sad. i'm in the military seeing drastic don't drink don't don't do anything nothing everything's bad for you except red bull and pre-workout and then on the other end i'm seeing my friend in college and i'm like yo this looks cool. Um, what? I'm at the parties and I'm like, so I'm not smoking. But now I'm older. I'm like, oh, I was definitely getting secondhand highs. Like I was for sure. They were hot boxing college parties. So yeah, in, the Marines, in the Marines, I'm like, I, 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 I can't smoke. You know, I, I can't I can't do this. It'll ruin my career. I'll get a dishonorable discharge. And at the same time, I'm looking at one of my closest friends have the time of his life. <laughs> 
And I'm like, man, something, so I think he might be right, man. Maybe cannabis is going to take over one day. Um, so while I was in the Marines, I, I was part of one of the longest deployments since World War II. Um, I actually deployed as part of like the Libyan uh, Civil War. We were a response team. And when we came back, there were people who got dishonorable discharge for using cannabis to try to relax from some people had been on multiple deployments, whatever they had been through, you know, people were dealing with depression, stress. I saw people get in trouble for test. Like as soon as you come back from deployment, they test you for everything Whoa. because you just came back from a year of sobriety, no nothing. And people sometimes come back and go hard. So I was like, why are we being criminalized for being tired? Like, Stressed for out. needing to escape. Yeah. So that was the first time I lost friends to opioids, active duty, in uniform, like guys who had deployed. And I'm like, wait, this same person got in trouble for smoking weed, but they died from legal pills. So at this point in the military, I'm like, I'm missing something. Like there's something I'm watching my friend in college. I'm looking at the people. I'm like, yo, these are Marines. These are like our fighting force, our strong. And I'm like, PTSD, opioids, suicide. What is that thing? And then I learned that we've lost more people to suicide and PTSD than actual combat. And at that point, I was just like, one day I'm going to I'm going to put this all together. But I just kind of kept it in my back pocket Um, again. Like that's a lot of different cannabis experiences. And, you know, after I got out the military, I was a social smoker. But even still, I coached in the NCAA for six years. So I'm like only in the off season. If my athletes can't consume cannabis, neither can I. So what a coach. Yeah. Uh, and that's what, so, so let me, let me back it up. So you went to the military right out of, out of high school. Uh, and then, and then you, you went and you saw service throughout multiple parts of the world. It sounds like, and then you come back, you, you put, you're starting to see the, the devastation of PTSD on your, on your friends and, and, you know, uh, soldier, co-soldiers, and you're also seeing, you know, this other side where cannabis is becoming normalized and cannabis is is fun and, and it's, you know, got a cool vibe. All right. So but uh, Stephen Philpott Jr. has is, is oh, you go coaching. OK, so. So, yeah. OK. So tell me about your experience during, you know, overseeing student athletes. And and I guess just to to bring everybody back, this is Stephen Philpott Jr. And you're chiming into the Kenigma advisor elevation. We're diving into what got Stephen Philpott here, how he got his experience and and sort of where his background is. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about more about some of the articles that Stephen has, has dived into. But first, I really want to hear. You know, as you're an NCAA coach, you're starting to, you know, cannabis is becoming normalized. This is around 10 years ago, folks. Uh, and and uh, <laughs> uh, tell me, you know, how your relationship with cannabis changed and then tell me about your education. Yeah. So um, I guess one disclaimer. So I actually broke my leg while I was deployed, but didn't know it. It was my it was my fibula. So non weight bearing bone. I didn't like fracture my tibia and just walk around. Like, you broke your leg? And you can't. I'm just like, no, out. my ankle, the lower part. It was non weight bearing. But I did have to get a bunch Still of cortisol broken. injections. My foot was swelling up. And when I came back, I had two surgeries. Well, guess what they gave me for those surgeries? Opioids. So the buddy I'm talking about who overdosed, he overdosed on the same pills I was being prescribed for my surgery. So I was like, I promised myself when I get out of the Marines, I want to know about everything you put in your body, whether it's cannabis, whether it's pills, whether it's alcohol, whatever. why do these things do things to us once we put them inside our body? So I'm like, yeah, I want to be a doctor. And I was like, wait, you got a 1.8 GPA in high school. Buddy. <laughs> Maybe there's another way for you to learn about the human body. <laughs> the, being a doctor is not it. And shout out to my fiance. I love her so much. She's in medical school. Her parents are doctors. Cody, I talk to you all the time. I have no desire to be a doctor. <laughs> it's but a lot of work. Yeah, but I realized as a Marine who was like, you know, fitness was everything. Your availability, being available, sound mind and body, that's what people call, you know, he's a good Marine. So in my mind, I was like, how do, what's the difference between coming back from deployment, somebody having PTSD, what's going on physiologically, what might be happening internally, if alcohol is making this worse, why aren't we talking about this? If cannabis mm -hmm. helps, why aren't we talking about this? So that was my kind of promise to myself when I got out the Marines, I wanted to learn about the human body. So I first became a personal trainer, like pretty much everybody who's already in shape does. 
Um, but I was like, that's not giving me enough. So I actually got my undergrad in kinesiology, human physiology and nutrition um, to okay. learn about essentially the energy systems in the body. And, um, you know, how come some people are just born genetically like, hey, that guy doesn't work out, but he can do a 360 windmill between his legs and I can squat way more than him, but I can't jump higher. So these were things I like hard explanations, hard science. So I went to UIC, they're the number one public research institution in the state of Illinois. Um, and I got my undergrad in kinesiology. And that's when I started coaching and really learning about like, hey, these athletes that are overworked actually show some of the same symptoms as people who've come back from war. And people uh, look at me yeah. like, no, man, no way. It's true. Look at doctors who experienced, they, they worked in the hospitals during COVID they're showing signs of PTSD that people would show had they been in war. So to me, I'm like, oh, I think my buddy was right. I think that cannabis is going to be legal just for me knowing <laughs> that he, again, that the trauma he went through as somebody that had cancer, that cannabis helped him, the plant, the illegal one. Oh yeah, I'm interested. I'm sold now. So the entire time I was in NCAA, I knew athletes were using cannabis. You, you hear him talk about it. They're in the off season. And I'm sure. like, Why they're, they're this- young People too. They're twenty somethings growing up in America. I mean, this is this is uh, part of the course in in the United States, at least. Yeah. No. Absolutely. So when I when I, you know when you you turn on ESPN and you hear about a, a NCAA athlete, you know, taking their life or or dealing with anxiety or, or depression, you're just like, what are these athletes going through? And then I used my degree and I was like, wait, physiologically, their their, their nervous system is stressed Stress. out. They are just they, they're not getting the rest, the recovery. Something's going on internally. And that's when I was like, there's got to be some type of natural way that we can help ourselves. And it's like, um, have you not heard of cannabis? And that was the link. As soon as it was like an instant, like, dude, it's been right here on your shoulder your entire life. You, you've known people who sold cannabis, been raided by cannabis. Your grandfather's been to jail. Like all of these things just hit me at once. And I was like, something about our bodies being disturbed. I don't know what it is, but people just like cannabis. It makes them feel better. <laughs> Weed help. You can insert it in so many things. And, um, you know, I have narcolepsy myself. And when I heard that epilepsy was part of the reason that, you know, people were interested in legalizing CBD, that was me jumping off the diving board. When 2018, when they were like, hey, you know, we've legalized Epidiolex, FDA approved drug to treat epilepsy. CBD. I'm like, yep. wait, I have a neurological disorder too. Maybe that'll help me. Oh yeah, I'm sold. I'm in. So that was kind of me jumping from exercise physiology all the way over just head first into cannabis. So an interest in health is sort of what brought you here, right? And and some life experience, but but an interest in health. And I think it's so cool, you know, you identified a disrupted nervous system in in these athletes that you were seeing in these these other soldiers and and what's interesting to this nerd is the endocannabinoid system is the most abundant uh system on the nervous uh system it, it's abundant in your excitatory neurons and your inhibitory neurons both gaba and adrenaline uh it, all of the systems are connected through the ecs which is why cannabis can help with so many things, maybe doesn't fix all that many things either because it's a regulatory system. It's a it's a system to ch- made to keep things in balance, not to directly uh, affect other things. But I I love that that background. Okay, so you studied this human body. You're an, you're an athletic uh, trainer and coach. You're really trying to uh, you know help students find health. But then I thought you like plants, Stephen. I thought this whole thing, like my impression was you're a plant guy and you haven't talked about a plant yet. (laughs) I mean, yeah. So um, so one of the things I noticed when I was coaching in the NCAA, you know, I was one of those people. I got out the Marines and I thrived on like 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 just like go hard. Don't stop. Like one of the places I started off my strength conditioning career at was Northwestern. And if you Google Northwestern strength conditioning coach right now. You'll see guys with polo shirts with no sleeves in Minnesota when it's like, you know, negative 10 degrees. Because to us, mm-hmm. it was like that rah-rah, masculine, yeah, yeah. And at some point in time, I was like, I'm tired. I'm, I'm exhausted. Something in my body just feels, this feels fake. I can't keep this up. And I know this is what makes you a good coach, screaming at your athletes. <clears throat> the high energy, yeah. And that was never me. And one of the ways that I related to the athletes is I would – 
I, I had to train the like rehab group. Um, that was like, you know, okay. hey, you want to work with the athletes, you got to earn your way. So during practice, I couldn't even watch practice. I had to go in the football strength conditioning weight room and work with the punters and like the injured guys. But I was talking to them about nutrition. I was talking to them about their diets. I was talking to them about, yeah, man, I swear by tart cherry juice. I'm like, tart cherry juice, dude. Why would you care about tart cherry juice? And he's like, man, it decreases inflammation. Coach, you don't know that? And I'm like, <laughs> yo, let me go back and pay attention to this nutrition degree that I just got but didn't really look right. at. So now I'm interested in growing my own fruits and vegetables. One of my landlords was from Thailand in 2016 while I was an intern. And I was like, I don't have my rent money. He said, guess what you're going to help me do? I said, what? He said, we're going to dig up the whole side of the building and we're going to plant all of our fruits and vegetables and we're going to live off that. So in 2016 in Chicago, yep, me and my landlord dug up like maybe like 60 feet and we planted cucumbers, bell peppers, uh, cilantro, mint. Every he wanted to grow everything, every squash, watermelon. And I remember just going out to the garden, grabbing stuff and just eating and going like, this is the best my body's it's ever. So been. delicious. <laughs> I, I I started, la you know, I'm like, man, I, I'm really jealous of people in California. I see why they're like kale juice and smoothies, man. It just makes you feel good. <laughs> so now I'm eating things that are reducing the stress and the anxiety that I have from the military. And you're telling me that the wow, eating natural could help your body. Yeah. That is my phytonutrients, phytonutrients, not, not McDonald's, right? what, but McDonald's <laughs> has calories, right? Just calories in. We're just machines. Calories in, yeah. calories out. No, man, you no. really start looking at these these macro molecules that we don't talk about in plants. And my landlord being from Thailand would tell me like the spiritual component that he was looking at some of these herbs for. And I'm like, that's cool, man. I just think it makes me feel good. And he's like, yeah, we have words for that. And we have terms for that. And I drink kombucha because I feel good. So now I'm like, things that grow from the earth seem to help me better than the fried <laughs> chicken and the McDonald's. Okay. I can see that being a thing. So that's me just working in gardens. Every year in Chicago, I tell people like, did you know in Chicago? Yeah, this concrete, if there's dirt, you can grow fruits and vegetables. You can even grow them inside. So it became like a whispering thing. My aunt, I'm like, hey, you got a giant lot on the side of your building grow a garden. And I just started talking urban farming. You're talking yeah, about urban farming. And I, I'm like, hey, if you have a balcony, you can have an above ground pot and you can still plant stuff in there. People are like tomatoes. No, man. I'm like berries, tomatoes. I grew my first watermelon this year on my own. And I'm just like, dude, what are we doing? Like, why are we not? Why is everybody in Chicago? We have an amazing climate because of Lake Michigan. If you think about it, Illinois and Iowa grow more agriculture commodities than pretty much everybody else when it comes to wheat soy and corn the soil is super rich right because the lake used to be that sediment soil yeah absolutely so that right so i have this personal interest in not only just working in gardens as somebody who has deployed and it just calms me down but also when i put my hands into the ground and i'm working in the soil and it makes me feel good when i eat it it makes me feel even better so now the I'm food, not the soil y'all the food yes, i mean the, right? <laughs> i mean you can eat the soil it won't Probably won't hurt you, uh, so but it won't so taste I'm bigger. looking at these kids now in Chicago that have PTSD from being exposed to violence. And I'm like, oh, I see something here. Like, there's got to be a way to introduce our city to agriculture. And nobody really cared this entire time. Nobody's cared about it. But in 2019, when Chicagoans heard that cannabis was going to be recreationally legalized in Illinois, People are like, oh, I want to learn how to grow. I want to <laughs> learn how to grow cannabis. Plants, herbs, oh. all of them. <laughs> I tell people cannabis is like a worm on a hook. The hook is agriculture. The hook is climate change. The, the hook is ecology. But people really want to know about cannabis. Like they're really interested. So I teach people, and I guess we're kind of jumping into it now. My thing was, how do you get people on that hook that are just interested in cannabis how do you pull them all the way down the rabbit hole about plants, about plant uh -huh. nutrients, about phytonutrients, about health and wellness? So in Chicago, I kind of start these very basic conversations. They're like, look at the weed guy, right? It's like, I, I, I'm an environmental biologist who researches <laughs> a biological organism by the name of Cannabis Sativa L. But yeah, you can call me the weed guy if, that, if that's what helps I you. also go by that. <laughs> yeah, so in the process, you know, people are like, I want to grow really good stuff. And I'm like, hey, we got to talk about light. We got to talk about the light spectrum. The light spectrum, rainbows, man. And they're like, Steve, I said weed. 
I want to know about weed. Why are you talking about rainbows? And I'm like, so the plants can read different colors. And they're like, whoa. <laughs> okay, so yeah, no, go ahead and tell me about the rainbow again. Now I'm listening. So that's kind of what I've been using in my community. And honestly, when I decided to quit my corporate sports job, the top of, you know, I was a sports scientist for, for three and a half years traveling the world. And I just didn't like the corporate model. The corporate model drains so many good people and puts a ceiling on you. And I jumped off my corporate job with my corporate benefits and my corporate salary. And I decided I wanted to go back to school to get my master's um, in environmental biology. And I wanted to spend full time during COVID researching this plant. And that was the start of how I got here. Nice. Dude, that's that's really cool. So so you basically just decided to make the leap. You said, you know what? Not I'm so passionate about about growing plants and these little micro environments in the backyards of Chicago or inside Chicago homes in the winter. I'm ready to just to learn about how not just the cannabis plant. That's what I think is so cool about your background. It's environmental biology. So so life in a certain environment, right? And it turns out everything's an environment, little micro environments uh, all over the place, right? Oh man, it gets, <laughs> like I tell I tell people, you know, um, I've been looking under the microscope before and like my eyes got teary. I was like, yo, who did this? Like what, how did this get here? Like what, I don't understand. I've seen cities built so organized and to me humans, right? We organize stuff, we're structured, we're logical. And you look under that microscope and you're like, you couldn't do a fraction of what nature can do just <laughs> by like the wind blowing on a nice day. It's like, oh, humans, you invented cell phones, you know, dust. It's just like, there you go. There's your cannabis for free. And it's just like, what did you have to do to it? Nothing, nothing. You didn't have to. You just had to make sure the environment, like you said, was proper for that specific biological organism. That's what, you know, again, I think the first thing that really made me confident as we were legalizing, I said, I want to do one certification to let me know if it's worth jumping off the deep end. But somebody that has a degree in physiology and nutrition, I'm like, it's got to be, give me some science. And right. I was looking through all these different certifications and the Tricom Institute, they were the ones that had one that said, uh, they were talking about cranial nerves. And I was like, cranial nerves? What? So somebody's <laughs> actually talking about what the molecules in the plant are doing. I'm not an idiot. I know that the whole plant is not what's getting you high. There's some molecule somewhere that's doing something to some system that's sure. causing all these different various effects that people claim. So once I got that certification, I was like, boom, that's enough. That's all I need. Somebody said that there's these molecules growing inside these trichomes and that more research is needed. And I was like, I'm a, I'm a Marine Corps veteran. Like I fought for my country. I lived in a community where the war on drugs was. My buddies have been arrested. Why can't I be the scientist? Like, well, I should be the one to do it. So that was kind of my, I jumped straight into it. And you just started, wanted, wanted to start learning about plant molecules. And and so for those who don't know Stephen's work at uh, getting his environmental biology degree, uh, Stephen is a trichome nerd. And for, for those listening who might not know what a trichome is, first of all, you can go to Kenegma.com, look up uh, some wonderful images, help pervade by Stephen here about cannabis anatomy. Um, but in addition to that, uh, we we also know that that in this trichome where cannabinoids are made, there are terpenes made as well, the essential oils of plants. And Stephen likes to take really really close up pictures of these, like like the closest up pictures as you can get using what are called scanning electron microscopes, some of the most powerful microscopes known uh, to man. So Stephen is indeed a trichome nerd. Tell me what you're doing with this this mic this microscope. What do you what are you doing? Tell me about the brick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I guess to kind of give some perspective. So um, as a medical patient, I got my medical card when we first legalized. Um, it allows you to cultivate five plants in your home. So I have about almost three years now of cultivation experience, um, not only at home, but through some projects in the community. I work with a bunch of people that have hemp licenses. Um, and after getting my certification, I was just like, man, I don't think we care about cannabis. We just talk, we're really talking about what's inside the trichomes. Cause as an environmental <laughs> biologist, my thesis advisor is like, no, people are using the, the term Bract and Calyx wrong. And you're not talking about the stock. And she's talking about anatomy. And I'm like, Hey, nobody in the industry is even talking about that. They don't, 
they they say cannabis as an entire biological organism, but we're technically talking about the molecules being produced only in these these mature female cannabis. It's so the story is so convoluted because we're looking at it through a funnel. So to me, cannabis. I was like, yeah. So to me, I was like, well, if we're gonna look at it just the trichomes, let's really really look at them. <laughs> and I'm a big Marvel fan. I, I'm a jump. I'm a jump on my Marvel bandwagon for a second. But like, That's I good. learned, I learned how to read reading Marvel comics and Dinosaur magazine. Oh, wow. Yeah, when people were reading like traditional books, never had any of those. Yeah. But guess what? Once you learn how to name dinosaurs and Marvel's teaching you about the solar system, you learn a lot of stuff. So I was, I've always been interested in like time travel or Ant Man getting really, really small and. Magic School Bus, right? So all of those. Oh, I love that things. episode. The Magic School Bus, man. When when Miss Frizzle takes some microsized and and takes it, or or goes to the universe. Yeah. Uh, those were some childhood so, so uh, cartoons. It was I just loved. like you know, if we're talking about these 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 tiny little uh, uh, anatomical structures, I've been growing. I've been looking at them just like everybody else with a jeweler's loop. You know, right, so a cannabis flower, a female, if you look at her, you can see what looks like crystals or, or you know, uh, what else? Powder, or what some people say. Yeah, uh, but it, those are puggy. actually it frosty. Frosty. There, there. That's the right word. And but actually, these this is not a, a frost. These are little heads, resin filled heads that, that are produced on not just the cannabis plant. <laughs> and, and inside of them are defense molecules is usually what I like to say. You know, what I um, found really interesting is the trichomes that you're studying on, on the cannabis plant. There's trichomes on the tobacco plant that look very, very similar, except instead of being filled with cannabinoids, they're filled with nicotinoids or nicotine aka and that's again for the same reason so tell me more you zoom in you see this world of uh, your ant man you you dive into the to the cannabis plant what are we gonna see yeah so uh so what i was interested in was you know people kept saying hey these molecules right and, and i guess i always skip this part of my life while i was getting this certification i actually opened two dispensaries here in illinois as soon as we legalized, I wanted a job. I wanted, I don't like when people say they have experience from the back end. So I was like, if we're going to legalize in Illinois, this is the first time it's ever been recreationally legal. I want to experience it firsthand. I want to know what it's like. So I worked in two dispensaries, uh, Vera uh -oh. Life dispensaries for Pharmacan. I was actually the, uh, it's called an agent in charge. So I was a manager, supervisor at a dispensary. My first job in a dispensary was at a manager. And they told me I was qualified enough because of the certification that I had online. And what I found out when I got there was I was nobody was talking about the science of the plant and the stoners that I was talking about who had really been in this for 20, 30 years. They were like, hey, man, you know about terpenes, you know, about you know, about different types of concentrates. They were like, do you smoke? I'm like, I have friends that have been stoners my whole life, but I'm interested in the science. And people would be like. Yo, do that, man. Do, we support do you. Yeah, do that. Because <laughs> in this dispensary, it ain't going down. We're talking about indica versus sativa. We're not actually talking about the molecules and how different molecules may actually help different people with different ailment. No, we're not even close to having that conversation. We're not even categorizing it correctly. So as right. an environmental biologist, every organism on this planet has some type of categorization. And they fit in those categories based on their forms, based on their function, how they look how they act. And to me, even when you go all the way down to these trichomes, well, like you said, there's trichomes on tons of different plants and they help those plants produce different types of molecules at different rates. And even mm -hmm. cannabis plants, For different clones, reasons. if you take clones, we say, oh, they're genetically identical. Put those clones in different environments and watch what happens. They're living <laughs> organisms. You can't say that, oh, OG Kush always grows this way. No, it doesn't. And that's just not true. It grows very different. What did you feed it? What was the temperature? What was the CO2 air movement? Did any pests get involved? Was it stressed early in life? I think that's the craziest thing that we're learning about environmental biology, not just of plants, but of humans too. Major stressors early in life. Let's pretend you're a human and you had an uh, abusive uh, childhood and, and you unfortunately lost a parent at an early age. These life early stressors, you're more likely to have chronic disease later in life. And we see this with plants as well. 
if you stress the plant out and it's young, it will never grow to be as tall as its as its sibling or yeah. clone. So what was super interesting to me was I was like, so how is the plant responding? Like it's not moving, it's not getting up and going, hey, close the blinds, it's too bright in here. And it was like, so you know those things that you all are charging people for in the store, those products? Yeah, the ones that are full of THC and CBD. The plants are making specialized na natural recipes. In my mind, the plants have a wall of like 2 billion keys. And based on the environment, they're just flipping keys and like, hey, we can play chess all day. But the plant can, res these plants are so resilient. I've never, conceptually, I think I disrespected plants. I think most of us do. We're like, oh, those things just sit there and soak up sunlight. They die every year. And it's just like, hey, man. <laughs> The plants are playing jokes on us because they're not moving. But yeah, what the plant is able to do in response, like you said, tobacco, I'm, gl I'm glad you brought that up. So there's research that showed these hemp plants and the hemp plants that have higher CBD concentrations have less tobacco hornworms. And somebody was like, hmm, that's interesting. So of course they went into the laboratory, they did different versions of this trial and they were like, wow, CBD is actually decreasing the life hornworm. Yeah, it, it's a pesticide. It is a naturally occurring pesticide. And it's like, hey, do you know how terrible we are in the United States with pesticides? And you're telling me this plant is able to, <laughs> right? So we're talking about like cannabis is now not just about our health, our wellness, our communities. It's an ecological thing. Like it's so much yes. bigger. And it's not just cannabis. It's plants. Like we have to really expand I think that's why everybody's like, I feel something. It's something's in the air. I'm like, no, I think, you know, we kind of ruined the planet. And at the same time, we're having these advanced breakthroughs about like, hey, these plants are able to respond to their environment and produce these, you know, full spectrum, uh, diverse array of phytochemicals that seem to benefit us. So that's why I got interested I in trichomes. <laughs> Yeah, well, no, I think I think the takeaway message there is that we all say cannabis, and oftentimes we're not even referring to cannabis, we're talking about THC, right, or high THC cannabis, and then we're talking about, oh, okay, well, it produces a, like this is potent cannabis, but potent is is kind of a difficult word to really categorize because the the synergy of the entourage effect is not as simple as just THC, as, as much as the industry is now recognizing, um, and certainly we can teach a cannabis plant to crank out a ton of one molecule, but we haven't yet figured out if that's optimal or maybe the plant when not being such so strongly manipulated can actually produce a better um, symphony of molecules. So I think that's really interesting. And I, I kind of want to jump to my next question, but I want to welcome anyone who's joined in the last 10 minutes. This is the Kenigma's advisor elevation. We are with our cultivation expert, former Marine coach, trainer, urban gardener, environmental biologist, soon to oh, graduate, man, hemp researcher. Good. I'm keeping going. I can keep going. And and we're really excited uh, because we're going to be at MJ BizCon together next week uh, for our second uh, in-person meetup. We went to CanMed earlier this year. The Kenigma is super jazzed to have us all descend. So if you're going to MJ BizCon and you're watching this stream, absolutely get, get a hold of the Kenigma. Find us there. We, we're going to be all over the place. Now, Back to what I wanted to ask, okay? We talked about this, this balance, this magic that the plants are doing. And we talked about Illinois, where you're from, where you grew up, and how you can only grow indoor plants. And then I mentioned here in California, we actually now have appellations. In other words, you can, you can claim that if my, my cannabis is grown outdoor in the soil in Mendocino, now it's a special type of cannabis. So is it true? What does the sun do that my LEDs or my my uh, high pressure sodium lights don't? Yeah, so it's really funny. So I Appalachians was actually one of the things that I heard about when I took my first certification and they gave me the analogy of, you know, uh, cognac can only be made from grapes in cognac, France. If they catch mm -hmm. you calling your stuff cognac and the grapes didn't come from cognac, France, you'll get sued. It's a very easy, yeah. it's like a... Book club. Same thing with champagne. Champagne, the bourbon, technically. There's bunch, yeah, there's a bunch of things. So when you think about how sensitive cannabis is to the environment, it's like, oh, yeah, this should, this crop possibly has some type of regional specificity to it based on things like 
the typicity, the terroir, the pH in the soil. Um, you can take okay, those or, are you fancy know, words for environment of the <laughs> of the soil. That it, we're just you know you really got into it, but yeah, this is the the nutrients available to the plant, the angle at which the sun is hitting the plant, and how this is going to affect its yeah. secondary metabolite profile, aka so, the terps and the cannabinoids. Yeah. So to answer your question about the sunlight, you know, um, NASA has a giant calculator online where you can actually look at the average daily amount of photons that hit your area code per day. And somebody might go like, cool, don't really care about that. (laughs) Like, that's great, bro. What are you even talking about? So everybody will go California sunnier than Illinois is right now. Okay, duh. That's just kind of like an assumption. But that's not a very intelligent and thoughtful way of thinking about it. When you're talking about more sunlight, what are you really talking about? Well, you're talking about more. Yeah, you're talking about more energy is what you're talking about. More daylight energy. And because California also has a warmer climate, the plants are already primed. to If they get enough of the right solar energy, it's just a balancing system. Like I said, if the plants are in the right temperature, right humidity, they're getting the right amount of photons per day, which is essentially power driving its energy, right? It's energy driving what the plant needs to do. You're it's getting like food this. for us. Yeah. So you're, you're getting these high energy photons and by high energy, I'm talking about like, again, think about the rainbow spectrum, yeah. right? So on the rainbow, on your red end, you have the low energy, right? And then on the right end where you have your, your blue in your rainbow or your, your, your violets, those are higher energy photons. So the color of light actually has a corresponding energy to it. And people don't think about that. Red light, blue light, the color of light has a different energy wavelength to it. So that's how I look at the world. That's how I look at everything, because now I know plants can see it. They can sense it when we can't. You know, if I use a blue light or excuse me, a black light, it makes things that are invisible visible. Right. Right. Because that is a different spectrum that humans cannot see with their eyes. I needed a light to shine on whatever that biological substances substance yeah (laughs) whatever it it might be yeah and then then it it lights up and it's just like yo that's magical and it's just like no that's just you're using light so the plants can see these things which makes it super trippy because we can't we see light is white we're like oh this the light is white it's like no man that light has different energies to it and they found that out in california during the wildfires around covid so you have this thick black smoke It's covering California and it's actually absorbing some of the sunlight and it's changing the light spectrum that the plants are actually being exposed to. So now the plants are stressing out. You're getting all these different responses and, you know, the government's like, burn your crops. Your hemp's illegal. You did something bad. And it's like, no, man, if you understand that the plant was just producing more THC possibly to respond to the stresses going on in its environment, that's just intelligent science. And the fact that those aren't the conversations that were happening, that we're having, they honestly bother me as somebody who grew up in the city that they use the war on drugs to destroy. Because we have the knowledge now, and we just kind of have to put it together. And LED lights, as great as the spectrum, they say full spectrum, even if the spectrums are there, the intensity of each color can never compare to the sun. So again, that Roy G. Biv, the, think about the rainbow. Your light might have a lot of blues. And it's like, hey, it doesn't have a lot of greens. It might have a lot of it. It cannot compare to the intensity and the spectrum of the sun. And the sun's giving off more than just what visible light, which is what you're talking about. It's giving off ultraviolet light, A's and B's, and probably even more radiation. Gamma uh, rays. I mean, but kind of like I'm sure at some point. You know there is a di- there is a lot of spectrum there to be given off and and you know as someone who's really excited for the future of indoor cultivation excited by the advent of LEDs because of the environmental component right less energy compared to I still think outdoor makes the most sense for the, for the planet right the sun is already providing the energy it is so if we can do it outdoor then then that would be my general preference but let me jump I'll to count- that real quick because oh go ahead. I was going to say, I'll, I'll, I'll counter you. Um, I would say that California is one of the best examples. When I go to California, I talk to growers and I visit growers and they talk to me about how amazing the environment maybe used to be and how they can see the scales of balance and comfortability that they've had tipping. Now I see a lot of people that are maybe like doing some type of greenhouse, still using natural sunlight, still trying to keep their carbon footprint as low as possible. 
but also if there are some type of drastic climate events, they don't lose all of their crops. Because at this point, the climate is so drastic. You know, it's just flipping. Hey, drought, flood, drought, flood. And it's like, okay. Fire. <laughs> right. So it's just like, hey, at this point, I do think that greenhouses provide a little more uh, uh, adaptability to climate change. But again, to me, that's still outdoors. It's like I'm still using the sun. I'm still using natural ventilation. I'm just trying to add an extra layer of protection in case there is one of these crazy and control layers. too, you yep. know, and then that makes sense because look, I think, I think farmers <laughs> are probably the most adaptable of, of any of us. And, and so they're going to do what they need to do to, to have a successful crop and greenhouse, like you said, is a great option. You can kind of integrate both of them. Um, and, and, you know, kind of, uh, how can I say, use the sun as much as possible, but then let's say the, those storm clouds came rolling in or those fire clouds, then you had the option of, of protecting. So that makes complete sense to me. And then also, you know, in cold climates, you just can't grow cannabis all year long, but, uh, you know, it didn't stop people from trying, but it turns out it's a pretty energy and cost, um, inefficient, uh, approach, especially growing them in Canada, for example, if we were growing giant greenhouses or, or indoor grows for cannabis. We know that that has been a uh, race to the bottom, let's say. Yeah. And a, there's a map online. It's a really good research article. It says Illinois and Alaska have two of the highest carbon footprints uh, due to ingrown uh, or indoor cannabis. And it's just like, okay, well, Alaska makes sense. I guarantee they're using like high pressure sodium because it's freezing. And they're trying to use light that maybe gives off 10 to 15 degrees of heat. So they're not running heaters and lights at the same time. But I think it's really sad that here in the Midwest and an agriculture place that we're growing so much indoor cannabis and we have such a high carbon footprint because of it. And cannabis could do so much. It grows. It, it's actually, especially outdoor cannabis, loves the Midwest. It's It's got the right amount of, of rain, the right amount of humidity. I mean, certainly it comes with their own challenges, right? But but definitely, it's, it's my understanding that that is actually a great place to grow cannabis. And keep in mind, y'all, I'm saying cannabis because I'm not necessarily talking about, you know, smokable marijuana or, or high THC flower, but hemp. Hemp used for industrial purposes is one of my biggest and most exciting things. And one thing I wanted to get to while we talk about what do you think in the next five to 10 years, Stephen, what do you think that we could be using hemp for realistically to, to help? to help the planet in the short term. I know you're passionate about this, um, but you know, what can help hemp do? By the way, Stephen helps a bunch of people who are in the 2018 farm bill growing hemp all around Illinois. And he helps test their product and you can tell them what you do actually, but yeah, so, Stephen is deep in this space. Yeah. So, you know, hemp as a proxy is kind of like, if I could put it on a t-shirt, that's something I would do. Um, I've had people go, you know, hemp as a proxy. Yeah, hemp is, and I'll explain. I'll explain that statement in a second. <laughs> but um, a lot of my students, you know, because I do teach at one of the local community colleges, um, we are licensed through the Illinois Department of Agriculture as one of seven schools to actually teach cannabis education, and we're the only one of the seven to actually grow cannabis on site. Um, so I actually do grow hemp as a part of my job working with students as I teach them the anatomy, we have a greenhouse we can go to and actually work with the plant. And it's hilarious when my students come in and they say, professor, are you sure this is hemp? And I'm like, yeah, this is hemp. And they're like, professor, I can smell it. Are you sure that this is hemp? And I'm like, listen, I, I, and they're like, no, no, no. I understand what you taught me in class. I hear all of that, but I know what I smell. And I'm like, this is amazing. Like, this is a great experience for people to have, to have that moment. Like, Professor, what's it different about smells this? Smells like weed. <laughs> right. So again, you know, as a scientist, I'm thinking about the pathways. I'm like, hey, if THCA and CBDA both have the same precursor molecule, CBGA, that's telling me that the enzymes, the only thing stopping you from getting both one of one. What are we really talking? Hemp. What are you what, what are you saying when you say hemp? Like, what are you really saying? Cannabis. Low, t low THC cannabis. Right. So you're saying cannabis. So I think as we get more towards like chemotypes and different things like that, um, I think our fiber rich crops, I think that's kind of what you're asking about when you say hemp. So I wanted to make that distinction first. But I think that the fiber rich uh, crops, I think that they're slowly going to continue to be blended into cotton and other things. C cotton's terrible for the environment. It ruins the soil. It's an awful companion crop. It kills everything that is near. 
Hemp it needs a, a bunch of pesticides. Hemp is a great companion crop. It doesn't use as much water. There's a bunch of different parts you can actually use it for. So I think that our federal government, the USDA, I think they need to become directly involved and actually send funding to these farmers who are already combating climate change. Right. I think eight, over 80 percent of the hemp grown in the United States was grown for CBD. And that's a failed model. That to me, that's a failed mm-hmm. model. It's a race to the up- bottom, producing a bunch of Delta A and a bunch of these these semi synthetics because there's an abundance of CBD in the market. Yeah. So to me, it's a very it's a very easy like, hey, lumber, the price of lumber skyrocketed during COVID. If you look at, again, what cotton and different things like that do, I'm not saying hemp is going to just flat out knock cotton out. But once you start making these new materials that have integrated hemp and cotton, you see hempcrete, you know, which is just the herd, lime binder and water. And it just got legalized for building materials. It's, it's federally mm-hmm. approved now. So yep. Not, non-weight weight bearing uh, building. So insulation and soundproofing and all that good stuff. Yeah. And they're making Lego blocks out of these things. Like they're literally just making them stackable. And they're like, yeah, you connect all these pieces and you just built a house. And it's just like wow, if this is where we are and climate change is hitting us, I think climate change is pushing us towards the plant, to be honest. From a psychological perspective and how stressed we are, I see a lot of people now having the same symptoms of people who've been to war and they don't realize they're being exposed to it every day. So psychologically, you may exhibit some anxiety. We're chronically stressed. Absolutely. As, as a nation and as a world, like modernity is stressful and, and we yeah. have not adapted, right? We're, we're, genetically encoded to be easy to stress. Like, man, we do not have the teeth and the claws to not be afraid. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I totally hear you on that. And so chronic stress from a medical perspective, the endocannabinoid system, that is a target for health, totally with you. But hemp can help in another way, right? And that's where you were going with it. And that's carbon and, yeah. and phytoremediation, soil remediation. Yeah. So like the neighborhood that I live in or that I teach in, actually, um, it's known as the toxic donut. It has the largest concentration of hazardous waste disposal facilities in the United States of America. I think there's 17. Um, When you drive down the highway, you can smell the incinerator. It smells like like burning flesh almost. It makes you want to literally throw up. The schools that, that the school that I attend and do my research at and the school that I teach at are both in that neighborhood. Those are predominantly minority schools. So there's kids over there. They're all exposed to this. The EPA has done research. It's an EPA super fun site. It's extremely toxic. The trains that built America were built in that neighborhood. So there's arsenic in the soil, lead, cadmium, invasive species. And to me, I'm like, hey, if Illinois really wants to be at the forefront of cannabis, to me, this is where you come in and you say, hey, we're going to do it differently than everyone else. We're going to come in and truly explore the phytoremediative properties. We're going to also look into the health benefits and we're going to take the people who live in the communities that were destroyed by the war on drugs. And we're going to make sure that they're the ones working to build this right. industry. Employ so them. You get, you get people off the streets, you have less violence. And you. what does the state really care about? Revenue generating. And to me, the stigma is so strong from the war on drugs that people are ignoring the revenue generating opportunities to me. So that's why that's why I'm passionate about educating because to answer your question, what can't hemp do? Like that's a real <laughs> I always ask people, give me one problem in the world and I'll tell you how hemp can help it, whether it's nutrition, whether it's it's climate change, whether it's opportunities and resources, like all the problems There's, we have come from those. So it, look, I think you're absolutely right. Some of the biggest stressors could could be, you know, solved if we kind of set profitability aside for a second and really leverage learning and leverage nature instead of trying to I just saw on the internet today the first le- man-made leaf ever ever created was was uh, whatever. And it was just a meme or or whatnot, but it made me think Yo, guys, we already got trees that make leaves. I don't. We don't need to engineer leaves again. The nature did that, and it's likely they did it better than we will. But maybe we could consider planting more trees and planting more cannabis and, and leveraging what nature already does, which is gather carbon from the atmosphere and put it into the earth. Uh, and that's what we desperately need right now. So... Um, Stephen, thank you so much for for hanging out with me again today. And I'm super stoked to do it again in Vegas. Uh, You're on Instagram. Is there anywhere else you'd like to direct people to uh, to check you out? 
Yeah, so you can follow my consulting company on Zisha Consulting. Uh, we work with niche, small craft brands. Um, a lot of them here in Illinois, um, brands that typically have difficulty uh, either getting maybe organized and structured or trying to convey their message that they're connected to the community and local, but they want to get their message out to a bigger audience. So um, we actually work with companies from, you know, women's healthcare products all the way to cannabis brands that just got licensed to social equity brands. So that's Anzisha Consulting, A-N-Z-I-S-H-A. Um, Don't mess then, it up. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And then um, on Instagram, I'm Coach Jackpot with two T's. Coach Jackpot. And if you want to find Steven, you can see the link shared right here to, uh, you know, his his Kenigma author page. You'll find his most recent article on revegging cannabis. You'll find many articles around land race cannabis that he's reviewed, around uh, cannabis auto flowers, and so many, so many really interesting topics that cultivators care about. Um, really excited to explore that. You can go to his his Kenigma profile, find his LinkedIn, DM him and talk about Anzisha Consulting or any other questions you might have. Steven, thanks again, my man. Look forward to seeing you next week. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you, Marcelina, sharing that. And uh, yeah, this was so insightful. I've learned a lot about the cannabis plan, a little bit about, about your background. And I want everyone to know that if you're looking for a place to get reputable cannabis information, you have that kenegma.com. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Be well. Can't wait for the next advisor elevation. Peace. Peace.